All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day of class. This is terrific. I mean, it may not be your final class for all of your classes, but it's the final class for our class, which is terrific uh, that we made it this far. Um, I just feel like you kind of get the shaft uh, here because like the term is over and in other parts of the world, people are enjoying like warm weather and shorts uh, and leaves on the trees and we're enjoying none of that, but uh, you'll enjoy that during the finals period, I guess. <laughs> Things will get nice really quickly. So um, we have only a short class today. Uh, it's a half class. Um, and this will be a real half class, unlike the half class from two weeks ago when I said it would be a half class, and it actually just turned out to be a, a full class without a break. This one really will just be a half a class because they don't have much to uh, cover. But I do want to cover a little bit about the final exam coming up, of course. Um, so let's get started. Um, of course, oh, by the way, you know there is a quiz today, right? I think I sent that message around. Everybody should have that information. Uh, I would recommend taking it even if you don't need it because it can just be practice. Uh, there'll be some questions that might uh, reflect the kind of things you can expect to see uh, on the final. Uh, on rare occasion, uh, some of the questions are identical. I try to avoid that, but occasionally I don't check close enough. Uh, and you'll see a, an exact same question. So if you do see an exact same question, it probably just means I forgot to remove it, but uh, go ahead and take advantage of that. If you've answered a question before and you know the answer to it, uh, that's even better. So um, let's talk about the exam itself. Uh, so you know where it's gonna be. It's Thursday, April 13th at 9 a.m. in UCC 146. Uh, that's the same information that's on the registrar's site. Um, and that's the same information I think we've been uh, sharing. I'll obviously send around one more reminder next week uh, just to make sure everybody's on track. Um, as I did mention, I don't have this written up on the slide, but as I mentioned in the message uh, yesterday, uh, I had originally thought about scheduling a makeup exam for the final uh, a week after, uh, but I had forgotten that the policy now is makeup exams should not occur until after the exam period, which kind of makes sense because you've got other exams to deal with. If you've missed a final exam, you don't want to take a makeup to the final exam in the middle of finals period. So it will be scheduled for May 11th. The Department of Psychology is running sort of a large uh, makeup exam session, several of them uh, on that day in the Social Science Center. So I'll have more information about when that's going to be uh, if there is a need to schedule one. Uh, but May 11th will be when the makeup final exam will be. Uh, if you're still needing to make up a midterm exam, you can also uh, make it up at that time as well. Um, oh, by the way, this is another question you might have. What happens uh, if I turn in final marks and you've missed an exam? Uh, what will happen is uh, you'll get an incomplete uh, until you make up that exam. And if you don't make up the exam, uh, then I think it reverts to a zero or something like that after a, a, some period of time. I don't know what the official rule is in terms of uh, the period of time, but if you're in that situation, uh, just check on the registrar's site. Most of that stuff is fairly straightforward uh, and is sort of university policy, not my policy or departmental policy. Uh, so you'll get an incomplete if you haven't completed, uh, if you've missed an exam, uh, so that you won't end up with like a zero uh, for the mark. It'll just be INC incomplete until you make that up. So what about the exam itself? Mixed format, just like what you saw for the midterm. Uh, multiple choice, some short answer, and a few longer answer questions. Uh, 54 questions for a total of 100 points. And that should sound familiar because that's pretty much what the midterm was like. I think the midterm was like 46 questions, but it's the same thing. There's questions and there's a number of points uh, and uh, it's roughly the same amount of time. Uh, there are a few in this case where you might need to draw out the answer. What kind of things can you expect to draw out? You could probably use your imagination uh, about what we've talked about in the class so far. We do some circle diagrams. Good chance that that could be one of the things you might have to draw. Um, another one we talked about was the prospect uh, theory value function. That might be another one uh, that I ask you to draw. So those kinds of things that had a graphical representation, uh, I may ask those kinds of questions also. Um, and this, by the way, is taken from that final exam study guide, which gives you an idea of what I might uh, ask. Not every one of those topics on that study guide will be represented on the final. Uh, and it's possible a few things weren't quite mentioned that may still show up on the exam. But by and large, I'm going to choose the answer, the questions. Well, I've chosen the questions that are on the final exam. 
uh, that line up pretty well with that study guide that I attached to the message that I uh, sent around. So that should give you an idea of what to focus uh, your attention on. You'll notice there are some topics in the textbook and that we talked about in class uh, that I didn't mention on that. And so they're unlikely to show up uh, on the final exam. Does that seem, does that seem good? So go through that and see if you can sort of explain all of those. Uh, if you know what the terms are, you know what the bolded terms are, uh, you should be in good shape. So what should I bring to the exam? Well, I mean, I think we've you've probably all taken some final exams. So I know some of us are probably out of practice because last year we still had some exams online. So what you can expect to bring is exactly what you'd think. Bring a pen or a pencil and your ID. That's pretty much it. Everything else is up to you. Um, I'm saying fine to bring coffee tea, water, lip balm, hand sanitizer, earplugs, mask, and anything else you need to feel comfortable. There's probably some official university rule about not having beverages uh, in the classroom. Um, that doesn't seem like something that I would enforce <laughs> because I would want to have a beverage if I were uh, taking an exam. And the same things with like, you don't want to be without lip balm and you don't want to be without uh, hand sanitizer or earplugs. Whatever you feel is important, just bring those things. Um, obviously keep your bag with you under your desk. So I know some exams uh, ask you to leave your uh, bag in the front. That's occasionally happened. Um, that's just way too chaotic at the end in the beginning. So just keep your stuff with you, but make sure it's sealed up. Uh, obviously keep your phone on silent and in your bag. It's a closed book exam. Um, I'll open the doors at 8.55. Uh, the exams should already be at the seat. Uh, and you'll just take a seat wherever there's an exam booklet in front of you. Um, it's going to be exactly like the midterm, though, in the sense that uh, you won't have an exam booklet or a scantron. You'll just be writing directly on the exam sheet. Um, and just like the midterm, you can raise your hand and ask questions. If you're taking your exam in uh, accommodated services, uh, the same thing. Uh, they can contact me on uh, uh, email or something, and I can usually make a quick phone call or something like that. So if there are questions, I'm around during the entire time. Um, and then other stuff is pretty basic, like, uh, you know, if you're leaving to the washroom, it, just for everybody's uh, sanity, just make sure that you leave your phone there and say, I've left my phone in my bag, here it is, and now I'm off. Uh, and that way, nobody has any questions about anything. I'm not really interested in what happens when <laughs> You go to the washroom, you go to the washroom. This isn't like elementary school that you're going to be accompanied, though I think that's the official policy. Um, what should I study? This is the more important one. Uh, questions will be organized by topic, just like they were for the midterm. Second half of the class, everything from induction on. Uh, be able to define bold terms in the text. Those are the ones that really show up uh, easily for multiple choice and fill in the blank uh, questions. Uh, so often, and you probably saw this on the midterm, You'll get a definition and then I'll ask you for what is this a definition of, and you'll write the term in the little box. Uh, or it'll be a multiple choice question where you have to choose uh, the right definition. Um, this study guide, which I'm not gonna show any more of, but this is from the top half of that study guide, uh, shows the core topics that might appear on the final. So use it as a guide. Uh, if I mention something about uh, prospect theory uh, or loss aversion, uh, or those kinds of topics, just make sure you know uh, how to explain them in a few sentences. Uh, I do make reference to some specific studies. Uh, so those are things that you'll want to be able to explain. I think last week I made sort of a joke about how there might be a question on that uh, Maddox, Baldwin, and Markman study on uh, regulatory fit. Uh, there is a question <laughs> on the Maddox, Baldwin, and Markman study on regulatory fit. Uh, so uh, I won't tell you exactly what the question is, but you can kind of use your imagination to think about what that question might be. Uh, if you're using your imagination to sort of think about what kinds of questions, what kind of cognitive process are you relying on, by the way? What would be that process of trying to think forward about what kinds of question I might ask based on the things that I'm saying and what you've experienced in the past? Any guesses? One of the topics that's on the final. It's an inductive process. So you're uh, gathering information uh, based on priors, uh, based on things that you've experienced, and you're trying to predict what's gonna come next. I can't tell you the exact questions, but I can tell you the topics. And given the way I've asked things in the midterm, you can use that experience to sort of forecast what you think might be on the final exam. So I think with all of that, you should be able to prepare pretty well uh, for the final uh, in a week and a half.
Does that sound clear to everybody? So if you've got questions, um, next week, uh, prior to the exam, I'll still be on my office hours. Uh, so although we don't have a class next week, this is our final, our final meeting, my office hours are 1.30 to, is it 1 to 2.30 or 1.30 to 3? Well, whatever it says on the calendar, I'll be online. Uh, so you can still uh, make a quick Zoom appointment even next week if you've got questions leading up to the exam. I'll still be available. And finally, complete the course evaluations before the end of the class, which I think is at the end of this. When is the final day of classes? Is it Monday? Monday the final. So sometime before Monday, uh, you still have that you can complete the course evaluations. Uh, providing feedback on things that you liked about the class, things that you didn't like about the class, things that you think could be covered differently, uh, whatever kind of feedback that you have, uh, positive, negative, neutral, uh, constructive, uh, maybe not so much destructive feedback. If you've got destructive feedback, uh, maybe phrase it in a constructive way uh, so that it could be more helpful. So let's talk about expertise. We've probably got about an hour's worth of content and then that's it for the year. So um, I wanna cover three topics. These are the three topics that I cover in the textbook. These are the three topics that I mentioned in the study guide uh, that I'm gonna be asking questions about. And in fact, these are the things that will be the most relevant uh, to our final exam. So we wanna be able to define what an expert is. We've hinted at this in several lectures already, we've said that experts solve problems more effectively uh, than novices do, primarily by using system one reasoning more effectively. In other words, they have a lot of examples that they can refer to. If you're using your knowledge to do things, you've got a lot of knowledge as an expert. So we wanna define what an expert is. Uh, we wanna talk briefly about how expertise develops because there are several different possibilities. One possibility is that people get really good by practicing. They just do it over and over again. And, and that seems pretty reasonable, right? You spend a lot of time doing something, uh, you get really good at it. Uh, you can take advantage of those system one type heuristics. Uh, you can take advantage of encapsulated knowledge. There are other possibilities for why people get really, really good at things. And those might be things like uh, genetic advantages. Uh, those might be things like individual differences in personality, uh, individual differences uh, in uh, physical characteristics. And those might be things that apply only to particular kinds of experts, whether they're expert musicians or expert performance uh, in athletics. Uh, so those might be different kinds of expertise. Both of them are obviously important. Let's talk about how they balance. And then finally, we'll talk about some basic effects on expertise, perception, memory, and categorization. So what is an expert? Uh, Anders Ericsson uh, defines an expert as expertise and experts as something that passes three tests. It leads to performance that is consistently superior to that of the expert's peers. So that means expertise is kind of rel is a, is a relative uh, thing. So I might be an expert in cognitive psychology relative to uh, a graduate student population or an undergraduate population, but maybe not so much in comparison to others uh, at, my, at the same stage uh, in terms of uh, career. So other cognitive psychologists might know a lot more about a certain topic than I do uh, and might be consistently superior in terms of the kind of research they do. Uh, and they might be defined as experts in that peer group. So expertise is kind of a relative uh, construct, consistently superior to that of the expert's peers. Second, real expertise produces concrete results. In other words, things that can be measured concretely. Brain surgeons got to be good and have successful outcomes, right? So a, a surgeon has to be able to be uh, physically skilled to be able to carry out uh, whether it's manual surgery or robotic surgery or whatever else, but it also has to be successful surgery, right? You have to have successful outcomes. Chess players have to be able to win. And finally, true expertise can be replicated and measured in the lab. So you should be able to find that it is uh, something that can be not necessarily uh, measured with a questionnaire or necessarily measured with some kind of uh, survey, uh, but something that can be uh, measured uh, objectively uh, through performance measures or uh, through laboratory settings. 
uh, for example, chess expertise, we should be able to study uh, that they have some kinds of advantages, and we'll talk about what those are. Um, experts know how to solve new problems. This is a topic we've covered already. Um, you've got a set of skills for solving new problems. Last week, when we talked about problem solving, we suggested there are lots of different ways to go about it. One is by memory. One is by uh, using some general problem solving heuristics like hill climbing and means end analysis. Uh, and the idea with hill climbing and means end analysis is that we don't always, we use those when we don't always, when we don't already know how to go about solving the problem. Those are ways to limit the problem space. Uh, but for experts, most experts can find the operators uh, pretty quickly. So as you get better at solving a certain kind of problem, you get better at looking for the operators. You get better at limiting the problem space because you're familiar with the problem space, the pitfalls uh, in the problem space. And of course, it's kind of obvious too that experts just know the answer, uh, maybe from memory. Uh, so if it's a problem for one person, uh, a, a novice, for example, might need to use some general problem solving heuristics. An expert might be able to use familiarity and memory uh, to be able to solve the problem more automatically. What's the downside? We'll get to this at the end of the lecture. The downside, of course, is that you can uh, find yourself in a limiting factor. Uh, if you are uh, solving problems from experience and the problem landscape or the problem space shifts a little bit, you might be using the wrong heuristics. Uh, you may find yourself limited in your ability to solve uh, problems that deviate from the things that you have experience with. So we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, if, you know, one of the examples we'll give is tax attorneys uh, or tax uh, accountants, people who are dealing with complex tax law uh, might be experts, but if tax law changes, uh, then they become novices again because they have to acquire that new information. So they lose some of their expertise and they may make mistakes uh, based on using uh, their expertise. So experts aren't always better. Occasionally, uh, they can make errors by failing to see some of the exceptional cases or the outlier cases that don't fit into their level of expertise. So we talk, I talked about Anders Ericsson's definition of expertise. I want to talk about how he arrived at that definition. Um, and I want to talk about several different uh, studies that Anderson carried out. Uh, one introduces the idea of development through adult expertise. So if you're familiar with stages of childhood development, how many of you have covered topics in child development or uh, intro to psychology? We talk about the stages of development, right? So there are lots of different... Uh, approaches to that. There are personality stages. Uh, there are child developmental stages like Piagetian stages. So the idea of staged development uh, implies that as things are getting better, uh, as you're getting more familiar with something, uh, or as you're progressing, uh, you enter qualitatively different ways of solving problems or qualitatively different ways of thinking. Uh, Erickson has taken the same approach with expertise that we sort of go through different stages. Uh, you get familiar with something and then at some point, and I'll go to another plot, this is a, this is a non-scientific graph. <laughs> uh, this is just meant to illustrate the idea of a staged development. So you, let's, let's say you're learning how to play the piano, okay? Has anybody ever taken piano lessons? Has anybody ever taken piano lessons and been asked to not take piano lessons by one's piano teacher? also because I didn't practice. Um, so you got to practice after a certain point, right? You can make up a little bit, uh, you can get a little farther, you, know, you get a little bit far with uh, limited practice, but if you want to get beyond a certain level, you actually do have to commit yourself. Um, and that's what this is supposed to represent. You know, he's a kid learning how to play the piano, he's fine, he's putting in a little bit of practice, but then he says, you know what, I really, this is me saying, I don't really like it, so I'm going to quit. Or I could have said, I really like playing the piano, I'm gonna concentrate every day on getting better. And I'm gonna make sure that the practice happens on a regular basis. And I'm gonna make sure that the practice is specifically geared towards getting better. However, that practice takes place, right? You're doing stuff in order to improve. And that's this stage right here. Uh, the stage here is marked by a dramatic increase, an exponential increase in your ability, but also an increase in your practice time, as we'll see. 
So you could stay at this level here and just sort of become a casual musician. Uh, and you would likely stay down here. But this person uh, has decided, you know what, I want to get better. Uh, and at some point, they may transition into something that is a profession. Uh, in other words, they're so good that they can do this now for a living, meaning that they can practice every day uh, without having to worry about a different job, because that's their job. Uh, at which point, they may continue to get even better. So what this looks like across your entire experience level then, so if we've got the possibility of being okay and just sticking with it, being okay and then deciding to practice and develop, and then being okay practicing and develop and deciding to commit to it full time and becoming a professional musician, hockey player, or whatever. What we showed here was these three stages. Here's what it would look like. Um, across your lifespan. So uh, everyday skills, you just kind of get good at doing things. You put some time into it uh, and it's something you're doing every day. It becomes automatized. We're all familiar with what that's like because that's how we read. Uh, that's how we uh, input stuff to our uh, laptop, your typing ability, your writing uh, ability. Those things have become automatized. You may not be an expert reader per se. You might not be an expert typist or an expert handwriter, but you get good enough at it uh, that you no longer have to think about it. It becomes autonomous and associative. These are your everyday skills, right? Uh, to an extent, you've gotten so good at it, you don't even notice how good you are because you don't even have to think about it anymore. So we do a lot of things that we practice early on that feel like we're starting to become experts when we're, when we're very young, right? When you're learning how to read, you go from being illiterate to being literate, right? That's a big shift. Uh, and then you just kind of stay there and you get a little better, but you don't become an expert reader, right? Um, you just become a autonomous reader. You can read everything automatically. In many cases, people who might go through that second stage and then kind of stay there, enter this arrested development stage. In other words, once you were really good, <laughs> uh, you played... Uh, on the, um, you played on the rep team uh, for hockey uh, or baseball. Uh, so you were a competitive player uh, in your uh, elementary or early uh, secondary school career. And you could say this for anything else. Maybe this would be for a performance uh, or maybe you were really an elite ranked chess player, but you're, you lost interest uh, or other things took uh, precedence. And so you got really good maybe through high school. Uh, and then you just kind of stayed there, right? You're no longer a, pro you're not going to be a professional hockey player and you're not going to be a professional chess player, uh, but you're pretty good at it and you're certainly better than most people. Um, and so what you would be in is what Erickson refers to as this arrested development. Arrested in this case, meaning that you stopped, right? You stopped developing. You got good, but you stopped developing because your skills are no longer being practiced specifically with this goal of making them better. Most of us have something like that or several things like that that we could probably point to. Uh, I can point to a whole lot of them. Uh, I can point to them in terms of like my ability to do, uh, you know, computer programming and data analysis. I used to be pretty good at doing that when I was a postdoc because that's what I did. Uh, as you've transitioned into being a university professor and you're supervising students and training them, they get really good at doing it, <laughs> uh, much better than I am. Uh, so their coding skills are better than my skills. I'm no longer making improvements at that level. So I'm sort of, I'm okay. Uh, but my students get better than me pretty quickly because they're working uh, to try to improve. For some people though, and for some, for a lot of people in certain domains, they end up in this expert level. So whether that's uh, because they become a physician uh, and they're working in the hospital. And so therefore uh, they've achieved a fairly high level of expert performance as a diagnostician, uh, or maybe you're a university uh, professor, or maybe you're a coach uh, with a professional uh, team. So you've achieved a professional level of excellence uh, that puts you above most other people, puts you in that top 5% or top 10% uh, of people who would have started off on that pathway. Uh, and you continue to make improvements. Maybe you go through additional professional trainings. You just get better. That's this expert performance. And even among that, they're gonna be elite experts. There's always gonna be somebody better uh, unless you are at that very top level in some kind of competitive 
uh, domain. So even in this expert performance, there's going to be a ranked uh, difference, right? There's going to be that. Um, th there's going to be a sort of a, a, a comparative group, that peer group uh, of, of experience. So here's what Erickson did and his colleagues uh, in order to uncover this pattern of expertise. Uh, their original study, and this is a really highly cited study because of the amount of work that went into it and also because of the impact it had on the study of performance, practice, and expertise. Uh, they started uh, by looking at musicians. Uh, and so this looks at the Music Academy of West Berlin. Uh, so this would be a place where uh, you know, Western European classical music would already be at its high level. Anybody who gets into a, an academy like this would already be really good. So we're already going to use this idea of comparison, comparison peer group, right? These are already better than most uh, German violin players. Um, so out of the 14, so they get 10 students. This is a small sample size because there's a lot of work that went into uh, measuring and analyzing the data. Uh, so this is a, deliberately going to be a small qualitative uh, type study. Um, and essentially, they're asking them questions about their education. So uh, they've got 10 violinists who were the best, 10 violinists who were good. And remember, good at a great academy is better than most people. So these are average violinists at an elite academy. They're already probably better than most of us. Um, and then they selected 10 who were in a different department. So they specialized in violin, but they specialized in violin from an educational perspective. Uh, so that doesn't mean that they weren't good violin players. That meant that they were pursuing a level of study uh, or an area of study that had a different focus. What they were practicing at was being good music teachers rather than being uh, good music performers. So they're still really good. They're just practicing in a different way for a different outcome. Um, and then they matched students against, they, they matched them uh, against a different, uh, you know, to make sure that they were uh, different, you know, same age and everything. Um, and they asked them questions about their kind of practice. So they did diary studies to ask them, what did, you know, when did you start practicing? On average, how often did you practice? And they could ask their uh, family members to uh, corroborate that information. So you know, these are students, and if you were good at something, suppose one of you, you know, if you could imagine one of the things maybe you did when you were younger, whether it was violin, piano, hockey, ice skating, uh, cross country, whatever, uh, if you were training for it, you probably have some record and your parents probably have some record of how much time they spent driving to the arena uh, or how much time they spent uh, on private lessons. So you could probably get a pretty good idea of what you did when you were age six in terms of spending time trying to get good. What they found was that the best students, they're the ones shown in the, the uh, white box here, um, when they were at age six and age eight, there wasn't much different. But by age eight, 10, and 12, you can see that the people who ended up being the best students uh, had a clear memory and corroborated memory of practicing more hours. Um, so they, they're putting in five hours. Now they're putting in 10 hours a week. Everyone else, not so much. Uh, by the time they're in uh, middle adolescence, they're putting in 15 to 20 hours a week. That's almost as much as a you know, that's well more than a part-time job, just practicing the violin to get better. The only other group that's comparable to that are the group of professional uh, symphony orchestra violinists. So people who have already made it, you ask them and they say, yeah, when I was uh, age 14, I was practicing 20, 30 hours a week. Uh, and that's, that sort of pans out. The other groups, the good students, that divide starts somewhere between eight and 10. Uh, the good students and the music teacher uh, students have already started to drop down. They're still practicing a lot, but they're just not practicing as much. Um, and you can see that by the time they're in middle adolescence, uh, people who are planning to be music teachers or who, who are just good students are practicing a half as much. They're spending half as much time practicing the violin to get better. So the people who end up being professional symphony musicians or who are the best of the best in this elite academy are practicing twice as much a week uh, well before they reach that expert level. If you then do a similar analysis and you look at the accumulated practice, in other words, with each year, how many hours of practice, and you will find that by the time 
uh, they get to this professional level. By the time they become young adults and they're able to sort of pursue a profession as a musician, they've put in at least about 10,000 hours of practice on their instrument. And so this idea that it's 10,000 hours seems to be the dividing line uh, comes from this original uh, study. And they, they looked at other domains too. They found the same thing uh, with uh, piano practice. Uh, and they found the same. So you've got experts and amateurs. Amateurs meaning they learned how to play and they just kind of stuck with it and they have fun playing the piano, which is great, right? I mean, if you know how to play the piano, it's a skill you're never going to lose. And it's a fun skill to have. You can entertain your friends by sitting down at the piano and they'll say, wow, you're really good. That's you here, right? Uh, but you're not the same as someone who's put in 10,000 hours, right? They're going to be better uh, because they've practiced 10 times more. Uh, at getting better, not just playing, but practicing at getting better. It's the important thing is that you've got to practice to improve. Uh, and they found this with chess and with different kinds of sports. And so this uh, general finding seems pretty consistent that in order to reach that final level of expertise, a certain amount of practice is needed, deliberate practice, not just going through the motions, but deliberate practice with the deliberate intent to improve your performance and get better. So it's a pursuit of excellence, you might say. Um, and this has shown up uh, in lots of different domains. It's shown up in lots of studies. And the general answer seems to be about 10 years or 10,000 hours worth of deliberate practice. This is not a hard and fast rule. Uh, it's a correlational uh, idea that expertise seems to correlate with performance uh, or practice. Expert performance seems to correlate with practice uh, and the number seems to be around this 10,000 hours. That seems to be the dividing line uh, between experts and non-experts. Simon and Chase found this early on, that the minimum period of 10 years of intense preparation is required to reach exceptional grandmaster levels of chess performance, because we talked about Simon and Chase uh, with problem solving, and one of the domains they studied problem solving in was uh, chess uh, playing. So they noted early on, it takes about 10 years. Uh, all of Erickson's work has reviewed this 10-year rule. They called it a 10-year rule, but it's not a rule in the sense that uh, it's a necessary and sufficient condition. Uh, it seems to be somewhat necessary and definitely not sufficient. There are other things that are needed, as we'll see in a few slides. Um, some uh, authors and uh, sort of popular psychologists have gone a little bit overboard with it. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, whose uh, work you may have be familiar with, he's had a few books around this topic. Uh, he's a writer for The New Yorker um, and has also written a lot of popular science books. Uh, and he had a book called Outliers in 2008, uh, where he used this idea of the, he referred to it as 10,000 hours is the magic number of greatness. It's not what Erickson meant. It is not a magic number of greatness. Uh, it seems to be correlated with expert performance, but it's not a magic number. Uh, he did sort of point out that lots of people who became elite, elite experts benefited from circumstances that allowed them to uh, get those 10,000 hours more easily and faster than some of their peers and points out that people like uh, Bill Gates, for example, long before he founded Microsoft, had access to computing equipment close to the University, um, uh, University of Washington um, because of, of where their Seattle High School was located. Uh, the Beatles, for example, had a lot of time uh, practicing being uh, eight, you know, eight hour performances on a regular basis every day uh, in lots of nightclubs in Germany. So the idea that certain levels of expertise require this or, you know, or benefit from this 10,000 hours and that people by circumstance can achieve that more easily, uh, that does seem to be the case. So um, Erickson points out that it's not sufficient. Uh, the belief that a sufficient amount of experience or practice leads to maximal performance appears incorrect. So it's important, but it's not sufficient. Uh, there are other factors. Sometimes you just uh, you may have certain skills uh, that uh, allow you to put in those 10,000 hours more easily or allow you to get more out of them uh, or allow you to keep going with them. 
And lots of people can practice for 10,000 hours or get 10,000 hours of experience. That's what he's meaning. It's not a magic number. Uh, you can have 10,000 hours of experience doing something and not reach a level of expertise. Like, for example, reading, keyboarding skills, and handwriting. We have way more than 10,000 hours doing it, uh, but it's, it's an everyday skill, right? It's something that we've done for more than 10,000 hours, uh, but we're not necessarily experts at it. So there's no firm theoretical mechanism associated with this 10-year rule. So it is a correlational idea. Uh, it is one that seems to be associated, and there's reasons to show how and why it works. Um, but it's not a magic number per se. Let's look at some examples for how it deviates, though. So I'm going to talk about two meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is a, a, the kind of study, you're probably familiar with a meta-analysis, right? A meta-analysis is a kind of study where lots of different experiments and studies are examined uh, in order to determine how much uh, of a certain uh, variable influences an outcome. In this case, the two meta-analyses are looking at the role of deliberate practice as Erickson defined it, the number of hours of deliberate practice and how much variance they account for in expert level performance. So uh, what McNamara and colleagues have done is look at uh, a large number uh, of studies and then calculated for all of these different studies, uh, how much of the variance in the performance in those participants in all those studies can be accounted for by deliberate practice or something else. And what they found was that for some fields like games, music, and sports, roughly somewhere between one-fifth to one-quarter of the variance can be accounted for by deliberate practice and nothing else. In other words, if you're a chess player, at least a quarter of your of the variance among expert chess players can be attributed to this correlational nature. Uh, the more practice they get, the better they get. But that suggests that three quarters of it is accounted for by something else. <laughs> uh, so deliberate practice plays a big role. Uh, you know, 25% of that performance variance That's a big correlation. So in anything, in any domain, if 25% of the variance is accounted for uh, by a single, uh, you know, by a single variable, that's a strong relationship. So this suggests that for games, music, and sports, there's a pretty good relationship. If you practice chess more to get better, you're going to be better. If you practice music better, you're going to be better. Uh, if you practice gymnastics or write or uh, javelin or hockey uh, skills in order to get better, you're going to get better. Uh, and those are the, you know, that accounts for a lot of the performance. But a lot of it is not accounted for by that. And those might be other kinds of factors, which we'll get to in the next slide, but they might be things like a physical advantage, uh, especially in something like uh, athletics and sports, uh, certain body types and physical characteristics are going to lend themselves better uh, to a certain, you know, to one sport or another. Uh, and that's gonna be a dividing line uh, between, you know, elite experts and really good uh, competitors. Uh, other things like education and professions, though, uh, the amount of variance accounted for by deliberate practice is much smaller. Uh, education in this sense would mean any, anybody who's doing higher education like me, for example. Uh, professions would be uh, any kind of other non-education related profession like medical professionals or uh, legal professionals or uh, investment uh, and financial professionals. One of the reasons that the amount of practice doesn't seem to have a big effect there is that for medicine, for example, uh, there's a fairly standard trajectory you have to go to to get in that 10,000 hours, right? You got to go to med school. Uh, and then in med school, you've got to do a residency. Uh, and then you have to do a fellowship. Uh, and so you've put in about 10 years of expert level uh, practice to get good, but you've done pretty much the same as everyone else. Right. In order to get to that level, if you're going to be an endocrinologist, for example, there's a lot of work that goes into that. That's about 12 years worth of uh, post-secondary study in order to become an attending physician uh, in an endocrinology department. And you're going to get a lot of the same practice that everyone else does. Right? You'll have the same kind of internships. You have the same kind of fellowships, the same kind of residencies, the same kind of medical school. Uh, and so 
practice plays a much smaller role because everyone is getting a lot of the same practice. So other things, maybe like uh, other kinds of intellectual factors or other kinds of physical factors uh, or other kinds of uh, non-practice related skills, maybe different kinds of approaches to things uh, will end up um, being the dividing line. So for things for which you can practice and get really good at, seems to be a strong relationship. For things like education and professions for which uh, everyone has to have a lot of practice by definition in order to be a licensed physician or uh, a practicing attorney uh, or a university professor, uh, that level of deliberate practice doesn't seem to matter as much. Of course, it does matter because you don't get there unless you have the deliberate practice. It's that most people have the same level. Uh, and so there's less variance uh, in that deliberate practice. Um, they also did a, they looked at sports uh, more directly and found that overall sports in a second study uh, seems to maintain this one fifth of the variance, this 18% of variance accounted for by deliberate practice. So it's still a strong relationship in athletics and sports, whether it's uh, individual sports like gymnastics or swimming or team sports like rugby or baseball or soccer. Uh, there's still a big role uh, for practice. But what you do find is that for the elite samples, uh, for people who would be at the Olympic gold medal level, for example, deliberate practice doesn't seem to matter anymore. There you're looking at genetic and physical characteristics. There's probably a reason uh, beyond just deliberate practice that individuals can train for an Olympic event uh, probably all putting in uh, 30 or more hours a week in order to train for that Olympic event, uh, and someone will consistently be better, right? So if someone is consistently at the top of their game, they're going to be practicing a lot, and the person that they're, that's coming in second and third place in the Olympics, right, the, uh, the silver and gold medal winners are also practicing a lot. They're all practicing a lot. The one who's coming in uh, and getting the gold medal likely has other things uh, like a height advantage or a respiratory advantage uh, or a technique advantage. Uh, so lots of time practice, but maybe they have a different technique uh, to practice that has helped them, uh, or they've got a better coach uh, that's given them some sort of particular advantage in this, uh, in this sport. Same amount of practice time, but they're practicing in a slightly different way. And so for these elite samples, uh, there really does seem to be uh, a genetic or a physical uh, or otherwise individual characteristic uh, that, seems to, um, that seems to drive expertise. So once you get to this expert level, uh, what seems to change? So this is a course on psychology of thinking. So I, as much as I'd like to go into um, expertise in uh, sports and games, that's a different topic. So I wanna talk about sort of the cognitive changes. Once you enter into this expert level, what are some of the things that you do differently as an expert relative to novices? Well, one is uh, perception. Uh, experts tend to perceive uh, underlying characteristics and systems better than novices do. Novices tend to focus on surface features. Um, as an example, uh, bird experts. Um, one of the things, I don't know if this happened to you, but one of the things that happened during 2021 when most people were working from home, if they had a knowledge type job, and most students were working, studying from home, and I was teaching from home, is that I spent a lot more time looking at the birds in the backyard. Uh, birding and bird watching, for whatever reason, became very popular during the pandemic because people are sitting at home and they're like, wow, look at all those birds out there. I never really noticed. And I've become kind of you know, friendly now to all of the birds in the backyard. We know the different families. We know the different uh, times of year that different birds show up. Like all of a sudden those blue headed grackles or whatever they are, they're kind of noisy, just showed up last week and they've been hogging all the food uh, from the little tiny ones. Uh, so we started to notice all of this kind of stuff. I'm not an expert bird watcher, but people who are expert bird watchers can identify these species really quickly. Um, in fact, and we, we talked about this in the first half of the course, when we talked about categorization, we talked about the basic level of categorization. 
most of us identify birds as birds, right? We identify fruits as apples and oranges. But if you're an expert in that domain, you can perceive things readily at the subordinate level. You pick out the specifics. You're really good at identifying species. In fact, if you're an expert bird watcher, that's literally what you do, right? You learn to identify specific kinds of birds as quickly as possible. Uh, so for most of us, even me with my uh, two years of pandemic bird watching, I just assume that these are a lot of the same thing, right? They're all just little birds and they're slightly bigger birds. Um, these are birds up in the sky, <laughs> right? I don't know what they're, they could be uh, different kinds of hawks or different kinds of uh, birds of prey, but they could also be crows, right? I don't always know what's going on up there. Um, experts obviously are gonna be able to know these differences. So they're gonna be able to perceive the individual features more readily. Is anybody really good at birding, by the way? Uh, or got good at it sort of over the pandemic. It's a fun hobby, you know, you'd be able to tell these different kinds of birds, right? I'm never gonna become an expert birder, uh, but I'm still gonna, still gonna work at it. Um, this shows up systematically. So I was just giving you an example, but it shows up systematically in things like X-ray processing. Now, of course, a lot of X-rays are gonna be read uh, by artificial intelligence, uh, who are, you know, artificial AIs are going to be very good at doing this because they can also achieve a level of expertise in less than 10 years, right? You can give them sort of essentially that kind of uh, background much faster by training them really quickly on a large corpus of uh, images. But uh, when radiologists are learning how to read x-rays, uh, one of the things that an expert radiologist does is they ignore stuff that doesn't matter. Right. If you've ever looked at an X-ray, a chest X-ray, for example, and you were looking to see if there was something unusual in someone's lung, it would take most of us a little bit of time to figure out exactly what we're even looking at. Right? Uh, which side is which? I never know which side is which on an X-ray. Is the left side the left, or is the left side reversed, and so it's the right? I don't know. Um, so I'd have to, you know, check on that, and then I would have to figure out. Okay, this is the lung. This is the heart over here? I see something that looks unusual, but is that just the way it looks normally. An expert's gonna ignore all of that, right? They don't need to find out where the lungs are. They don't need to remember whether or not it's a reverse image. Uh, they don't need to you know, take into account uh, differences in heart shape and, and that sort of thing. If they're looking for an abnormality in the lung, they know where they're likely to occur. Uh, they can ignore the stuff that doesn't matter and they can focus on the areas of the X-ray in the lung where they expect abnormalities. Um, and so you can see this, in, so we've got four different levels of experience here, novices, residents, junior radiologists, so these are people sort of in that uh, training stage, and senior radiologists who would be uh, experts. Um, and one of the things, so in this particular study, we've got recognition accuracy. Uh, they're trying to recognize an x-ray that they've seen before um, for abnormal x-rays, normal x-rays, uh, and faces. Faces are a control image in this case because it shouldn't matter whether you're an expert radiologist or not, your ability to recognize and remember faces you've seen should be about the same. We're all pretty good at it. Um, so everybody's about the same on faces. Uh, recognition accuracy when they see it and then have to recognize it again, we're about 40%. Uh, so no difference between novices and senior radiologists on face recognition. However, uh, one of the things you'll notice is that for abnormal x-rays, these are ones that have, uh, these are ones that would have some kind of error in them. Uh, novices and expert, novices are about the same on that as they are on normal x-rays. So normal x-rays would be a chest x-ray that's perfectly normal. An abnormal chest x-ray would be one that has a problem, a tumor, uh, or some sort of abnormality. When you're a novice radiologist, you get about 10%. So doesn't matter whether it's normal or abnormal, they're kind of hard to remember because they have a lot of different features, unlike faces. For the abnormal x-rays, as your level of experience increases, so does your recognition accuracy. In other words, the expert radiologists are really good at remembering abnormal x-rays they've seen before because that's what they're spending their time doing, right? That's what they're training to do. That's what they're practicing to get good at is, identifying problems in an x-ray and then encoding those things so that they can describe them later on. Uh, so they're really good. In other words, they get so good that their performance on abnormal x-rays is almost as good as their performance on faces. 
faces being something that we're all pretty good at recognizing. Senior radiologists are pretty good at remembering and recognizing uh, X-rays that have abnormalities in them. However, they're actually worse at the ones that do not have an abnormality. Why would that be the case? Why would an expert radiologist, you know, the resident gets pretty good actually at these normal X-rays, but then radiologists actually are terrible. Like their performance is awful. They have no idea that they've seen them before. Why would expert senior radiologists get so bad at normal X-rays? Something they should see every day. What would be a good explanation for that? Maybe because it doesn't like stand out and like amongst like all the other weird ones they've seen. So they'd have to work. It would look like a lot of things they've seen. That's right. That's one good example. That's one good explanation. Another explanation uh, is that when an expert radiologist looks at a normal x-ray, that's there's nothing else to, to do about it, right? You can just, you've scanned the areas for abnormalities and now uh, you just don't pay attention. Uh, so it's almost like, it's like a word, you know, it's like seeing the word the, <laughs> or you know, saying a common word, you're not gonna recognize it because as you said, you see so many of them anyway that it just kind of blends in. And furthermore, you don't spend any time trying to encode the details because your job as a radiologist is to look for abnormalities. So they get really good here and they've clearly decided a strategy. The trade-off is to not get good here. Once you see an X-ray of a lung that doesn't have an abnormality, you just move on to the next thing, right? I mean, your job is not to remember x-rays. Uh, your job is to identify and remember abnormal x-rays. So it's a very specific perceptual expertise. They're not just better at remembering visual images because otherwise they'd be better at faces and they'd be better at normal x-rays. They're only better at remembering abnormal x-rays. Um, we're going to see this with chest memory as well. This is one of the studies that kind of launched the modern, uh, so the modern study of expertise. Even before Erickson's work on musicians, Chase and Simon were interested in what do chess experts do? Because we know that people get really good at chess. Uh, they can be good enough at chess that until recently could still beat uh, most AIs, right? Uh, until, you know, if you're a chess grandmaster, you spend a lot of time playing professional chess. And you could say the same thing about a professional poker player. If you spend a lot of time uh, playing poker and getting good at it, you could, you know, any kind of game like that. Um, so one of the questions that uh, some of these studies looked at is, how do they do it? How do you get to be really good at, at playing chess? So much so that you can quickly determine before a game is even over, whether or not you've won or not. Uh, that's something that, is, does anybody play chess really well? Or are you all equally bad as me? Um, okay, so I don't know what this feels like, but I can imagine it would feel pretty good to be a chess expert and to play chess against somebody and say, you know, I'm going to win in about four moves. Uh, sorry, there's there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, it's a foregone conclusion. Uh, you know, this is how it's going to end. But that's what a chess expert can do, right? They can recognize that the game is over before the game is even over. Uh, they can recognize what moves they need to do well in advance. And it's not just through uh, brute force calculation. They're not, com you know, comparing every possible move. They're using a systematic process, somewhat like what the expert radiologist is using. They're paying attention to the things that matter and not the things that don't matter. So the way they did this was to look at random positions versus real game positions. Um, so for example, when you set up chess, uh, you set it up in a particular way, right? You've got uh, black sides on one, uh, pieces on one side, white sides on, uh, white pieces on the other side. Uh, each of the pieces has a specific square that it has to go on in the setup, right? So even if you don't play chess, you recognize uh, that there's a specific and there's only one possible uh, setup. And furthermore, you know uh, that each of these pieces moves in a specific way, right? Uh, so that the uh, rook piece, the castle-shaped one, uh, moves in straight lines only. Uh, the knight, the little horsey, uh, moves in this L shape, right? Uh, and the bishop moves in a diagonal on the same color. And so there are constraints. Each one of these pieces moves in a certain way. And so that means that no matter what this you know, how far along in the game you get. If you're an expert chess player, you would recognize this as a game that's in progress. And furthermore, you would say, well, you know, this, this looks like a game that I've played before. Um, 
However, if you're an expert chess player, uh, this is meaningless to you. This is like a nonsense word because uh, even if you're a novice chess player, you recognize that this wouldn't happen, right? It wouldn't be possible, uh, for example, uh, to have, uh, where's, where's the clear example here? Um, it, was the, uh, oh, so it wouldn't be possible to have both of the white bishops on a black square, right? That's impossible to set up. Uh, though it is possible in, so I was gonna play this game just to see what it was like on the iPhone, probably really bad chess, uh, which has like no rules to it. Uh, so it doesn't follow the rules of chess. Um, this doesn't happen in real chess, right? Uh, so this would this is just a random configuration. Somebody just put the pieces on the board. Your job, by the way, in this experiment is to look at it for five seconds and then reconstruct it from memory, uh, which is not far off from what our expert radiologists were doing. Look at this x-ray and then recognize it later on uh, as one you've seen or not seen. So in this case, it's look at this chess board, take five seconds to look at it, take it away, now recreate it from memory. What they found was that at the novice level, uh, there's no difference between real game positions and random positions. In other words, most of us, when we're looking at something like this for five seconds or 10 seconds, we would say, okay, there was a black uh, castle in the corner, a white castle down here, and you might try to use some verbal strategy to memorize them. And it's gonna be about the same as your working memory capacity. You'll remember four or five pieces. And furthermore, it doesn't make any difference whether it's this one or this one if you're a novice because the configuration, you're not really paying attention to. You're just trying to remember some pieces. But as expertise level gets higher, so as the experts, uh, in this case, uh, people who are professional chess players, uh, they're able to recall uh, a fairly significant number. In this case, in this particular study, uh, 22 pieces are able to be re correctly replaced because most expert chess players recognize the configuration as a particular game that is in play. If you've played chess for 10 years and you've been playing 10,000 hours worth of chess, you've seen all of these games, right? You've seen games before. You know that there are configurations of pieces that occur at a certain stage in the game. And so when you see this, you don't have to memorize the positions. You just say, oh, I recognize that, that is the X position in some game, five moves in. And so then you don't need to remember the actual positions from the perceptual presentation. You remember it conceptually from your memory of having seen this game lots of times. Sort of like what the expert radiologist does. They don't remember all of the details about the lungs and the heart, they just remember the piece uh, that they were looking for, which was the abnormality. In this case, what the expert is looking for is to recognize, okay, I recognize this. I've seen this position before. I've played this position before. I played this position yesterday. I was in this game. And so they don't need to remember each position. They just do it from memory. They've already got it in their memory. They do it from conceptual uh, knowledge. So not memory. I mean, they do it from knowledge rather than an individual uh, episodic memory. Uh, whereas for random positions, they're still no better. They're as bad as the novices for random positions because for the random position, for both of them, it's like a nonsense word. It's just a jumble of letters, or in this case, it's a jumble of chess pieces. It's just as meaningless for the expert as it is for the novice. So the expert has better memory, but only in their domain of expertise and only for things that are relevant. In this case, game legal game positions that are relevant uh, to expert chess. They're not better at putting pieces on the board. They're better uh, at remembering the legal positions. Let's talk finally about two studies that look at categorization. And these will be the final two topics that we'll uh, cover today. So I wanna talk about two different experiments, which I, I really like these studies because this is a great example of studying something that is, I don't say not practical, but a practical area of expertise, but using methods in cognitive science uh, to do it. Uh, so the first is a study from 1981, she, Feltovich, and Glaser. Uh, and this is one of the most highly cited papers in this particular journal, Cognitive Science. What they were doing was trying to understand what makes a physics expert different from an undergrad. Does anybody remember taking physics either in university or in high school. Did anybody remember liking physics in university or high school? 
I really liked it when I took it in university because it was kind of fun to solve little problems, right? The entire first year physics class is solving problems around different kinds of rules, right? You get rules about pr principles of motion or mechanics or anything else, and then you got to solve this problem. How much, you know, how fast is this thing going to go when it hits the ground? That kind of thing. Those are sort of fun little problems to solve. Um, as you get better in physics, and let's say by the time you're a PhD student, maybe you're not an expert by Erickson's definition. Maybe you're not 10,000 hours expert, but compared to an undergraduate, you're pretty good, right? You've gone through undergraduate physics well enough to be able to get into a PhD program. So you've been doing physics probably for uh, five or six years now, and you've been concentrating on physics, uh, and you have an aptitude for physics and everything else. So by the time you get into a physics PhD program, you're really good at physics. <laughs> you love physics. You do it every day, right? I mean, that's what you're doing for a living. You're doing professional physics. Um, and then they said, okay, we want you to sort some basic physics problems. Go back to a first year university physics textbook and take out some of the problems for them. And what we want you to do is to sort these problems into groups based on how they should be solved um, and based on any other characteristics you think put them into groups. What they found in general, we'll go into a little bit more detail, but what they found in general was the novice, the undergraduate, people like you and I who have had one class in university physics, uh, put these together on the basis of surface characteristics. In other words, do they look the same? Do they have a pulley in them? Do they have a, you know, a triangle block on them? If they look the same, then they're probably solved the same, which you know is not true in physics, which is why most of us got a you know, 59 in physics, <laughs> because if they look the same, they aren't necessarily solved the same, right? Uh, if you're an expert in physics, you know that, and you, you're not fooled by that, right? You don't have to worry about what the problem looks like, because you look at the problem itself from the conceptual side. What are the principles of physics that are needed to solve this problem? So the, ex the novices, the people who are not going to end up going on in physics because they barely passed university physics, uh, they got caught up in surface details. Experts, not so much. So here's what we do for this study. Um, this is done in 1981. Uh, so none of this was done on a computer screen. Basically, they had three by five index cards, which are the, are the kind of cards you might use if you're doing little flash, you know, little flash cards or cards for giving a talk or something like that. And they just sorted 24 problems into groups based on similarities of solution. They didn't have to solve the problems, um, so they weren't asked to go through and come up with the answer. They were just asked to say, put these into groups based on how similar they should be solved. Given a few times to redo it until they were happy with it. Uh, here are some examples. Um, so here are some, this is problem 10 and problem 11 from unit 11, unit 39. This corresponds to the textbook that they use. So here are two problems uh, that look like they go together. And the novice puts them together because uh, they have circular things, angular speeds, something rotating. In other words, they've described in their rationale for why they go together, the fact that the problems look the same. They look the same because there's something going around. There's a circular thing and there's some kind of angular momentum. And that might be the right answer, but it might not be the right answer. The problem is that they didn't really go into detail about the actual solution. All they did was say that they have uh, something rotating. Problem seven and problem seven, 723 and 735, they group together because they deal with blocks on an inclined plane, blocks on an inclined plane, coefficient of friction. Um, these are people sort of probably on their way to not passing uh, their university physics class. Uh, because they've grouped them together and they don't belong together. However, look at the experts over here. Let me move myself out of the way. Uh, one of the things you'll notice about experts is that they're happy to put things together that do not look at all the same, but they know why. Um, so for example, uh, this problem with the little spring and the block and the lines here uh, and this problem, 621 and 735, the same one that you saw down here, are put together because it's conservation of energy, work energy theorem, straightforward problems. Yeah, maybe to you. 
Uh, these can be done from energy considerations. Either you should know the principle of conservation of energy or work is lost somewhere. So they have a really clear explanation of why these things go together. And it doesn't have anything to do with the surface characteristics. That doesn't mean they're ignoring the surface characteristics, but this should remind you of the radiologists who ignored things that didn't matter. Uh, they ignored the aspects of the problem that are not relevant. And in this case, uh, what's relevant is the principle of physics that's needed to solve the problem, uh, the work energy theorem in this case. Um, and here's another example of things that don't look the same, pulleys and what looks like a human being falling down. Uh, these can be solved by Newton's second law. Uh, everybody's fine with that. The experts know exactly why these two very physically different problems go together because they need the same basic principle of physics uh, in order to solve them. Uh, when they're asked to elaborate, one of the things you'll notice is that experts obviously notice the surface details. They just don't care as much about them. And furthermore, so here's an example of a novice's elaboration on the inclined plane problem. They mentioned, this is, what, this is a qualitative analysis. This is what they talk about. Um, and they plot this out. So here's a plane, it's an inclined plane. It involves the angle, there's a block, there's a length, there's a surface property, forces, mass, height. You'll notice these are all characteristics of the physical object. Kind of makes sense, right? It's a class in physics. So they're paying attention to the materials. They're paying attention to what it looks like. <clears throat> The novice does not ignore, or the expert does not ignore that. They also know that it's a block and there's some surface properties that are important. But notice how much sparser their representation is for the physical characteristics. In other words, the surface properties. They only mention the things that matter. Uh, they don't need to fill in all the detail. And furthermore, uh, they have an arrow pointing to their deep knowledge of actual physics. So the novice stays solely on the surface characteristics. The expert says, okay, surface characteristics, this tells me about the problem, and now I have access to this knowledge of physics uh, that I can use to solve the problem. So there's a deeper level of understanding. And what uh, she et al, and we'll see in the next slide, is that uh, experts have access to deeper features. So deeper in that semantic depth uh, definition. It's a deeper level of processing. Uh, they can look beyond the surface of something, beyond the surface characteristics, and pay attention to the uh, solution that's needed. Or in the case of the radiologist, pay attention to uh, the abnormalities. Or in the case of the chess experts, pay attention to how far along in the game uh, it was. Uh, so that's what seems to make experts different. It's not that they don't see the surface characteristics, it's just that they know that most of them don't matter for solving the problem. What matters are those uh, solution relevant uh, features. Last study I wanna talk about uh, looks at different kinds of expertise. So, so far we've been comparing experts from novices, but if the idea that experts get better at being able to identify solution relevant features, then you should also see differences in kinds of experts. Because if your expertise is of one kind, you pay attention to one kind of solution. If you're a different kind of expert, you would pay attention to a different kind of deep feature solution. And so you should see some systematic differences between kinds of experts. Doug Medine and colleagues had a really interesting way of doing this. They looked at tree experts. Uh, they were at Northwestern University. Uh, which is north of Chicago, uh, at a climate that's pretty similar to London. Uh, so it's along the Great Lakes, uh, lots of trees, and the city, just like London, uh, and just like Toronto, and every other city around uh, in, this, in this area, employs arborists to look after uh, municipal trees. So the city of London has uh, you know, in, in their uh, outdoor staff, people whose job it is to pay attention to the health of the trees, uh, which ones are going to be cut down, which ones need to be planted, uh, what kind of maintenance needs to be done on the trees. And this would be true of golf courses. This would be true of parks. Uh, any municipal group or group that's paying, or you know, a, a, a professional that's paying attention to the health of trees uh, is going to be a certain kind of uh, arborist or maintenance worker. But that's a different kind of expertise from a designer. 
if you are someone who designs golf courses or designs large industrial landscapes, your area of expertise is similar, but not exactly the same because the park maintenance workers and the city maintenance workers are looking after a whole range of different kinds of trees in a municipal environment. Landscape architects are looking after planting uh, and designing landscapes with an eye towards the entire development of, uh, of the tree's lifespan. So you want certain kinds of trees that live, you know, that grow quickly, maybe, if you're planning a golf course. Uh, if you are planning a golf course and the trees make a mess, you don't want them there, right? Because then it produces extra waste, you know, like a lot of like walnut trees, for example. You would never plant a black walnut tree in a golf course because then you'd have, you know, black walnuts rolling all around the golf course, which would be suboptimal. Someone would have to come and pick those up. Then they looked at taxonomists, people who worked in the biology and the botany department, uh, plant scientists uh, at Northwestern University, whose job it was to understand the relationship of one kind of plant to the other. So they knew about the genetics, they knew about the taxonomy, uh, and they knew about different kinds of uh, types of trees. And their job was kind of similar to the she et al study. They wanted to, they gave them a label you know, cards and put them into groups. So put these trees into as many groups as possible and then divide them into smaller groups. Uh, so we examine the grouping of tree species, explanations for those groupings provided by the three types of tree experts. Are there differences in spontaneously generated taxonomies? In other words, do all three groups just put them into the same subcategories or do landscape architects use different kinds of strategies when they sort them relative to maintenance workers, relative to taxonomists? Um, basic instructions, put these trees that go, put together the trees that go together by, by nature into as many different groups as you'd like. So very open-ended, just put these into groups uh, and keep doing it until you're happy with that group. So if you've decided to put the, uh, you know, the, the, the ash tree over here and then you change your mind, you can sort of switch things around a little bit. Then they looked at the rationalizations, the descriptions of each one of their sorts. One of the interesting things they found was that the type of justification, uh, so taxonomists essentially sorted by what you would expect them to. They sorted by taxonomy. They put maple trees with maple trees and oak trees with oak trees. Uh, and they put uh, different kinds of evergreens together. So they used almost exclusively a taxonomic sort because that's their job is to understand tree taxonomy. So when asked to sort things into groups, they said, okay, well, I can do this. This is what we do for a living. We'll put them into taxonomies. Um, the expert maintenance group, uh, as you can see, they had a lot of different justifications. So their sorting was different. Now a lot of them use taxonomic sorts. I mean, it's obvious that you're gonna put maple trees together, um, but they also mentioned shape, morphology. They mentioned weed tree as being kind of important and lots of other things like the aesthetics uh, and the size. So it wasn't just taxonomy in their case. Landscapers, landscape architects were particularly interested, they were interested in taxonomy, but also all of them mentioned weed trees as an important characteristic. In other words, if you're designing a landscape or you're designing a golf course, you wanna know the difference between trees that are considered weeds and trees that are not considered weeds because you don't like to think of a tree as a weed, right? Because trees are trees, they're not weeds, but some trees are undesirable in aesthetic settings because maybe they shed a lot or they make a lot of mess or they're hard to clean up after or they grow too quickly and out of control or they don't grow uh, well in their surroundings or they grow they overtake everything else around them, right? So you would wanna know the difference between weed trees and non-weed trees. Landscapers really care about that because their livelihood depends on it. So the conclusion here is that different kinds of experts justify their sortings in different ways. And it seems to align with the kind of expert that they are. Then finally, um, so, they grouped, taxonomists and maintenance workers grouped by taxonomic structure, landscape architects were more likely to use these goal derived categories, particularly the weed category uh, structure. 
Second experiment that they did was they asked them to do an inductive reasoning task. So remember when we talked about inductive reasoning, when you're doing a categorical reasoning task, you're more likely to infer a property based on a coherent category or a category that you are more familiar with or a category that is the stronger of the two, right? So we talked about categorical reasoning. If you're reasoning about trees and like say one of the questions might be if this tree has a certain disease, now, which of these two trees might also have that certain disease? What should matter is taxonomy, right? If a disease, if one kind of elm tree is susceptible to a disease, you'd be more likely to find those biological properties in other elm trees, right? So the real categorization, I use that, would use that in quotes, right? The taxonomy, the scientific classification should be more relevant in this case. Your tendency to use a goal-derived category like weeds or aesthetic value or size might not matter as much because there wouldn't be some kind of parasite that would only affect big trees, right? There would be a parasite that might affect a certain kind of biological similarity. And that's what they found. Uh, so breaking down the response by subgroups, the mean proportion of scientific matches, meaning that they made inductions based on taxonomy, taxonomic inductions. 94% for the taxonomists, 84% for the landscapers and 79%. So everybody did pretty well uh, in terms of making these uh, decisions. But the, what I wanted to highlight was that the landscape architects were pretty flexible. They had a flexible level of expertise, flexible enough to know that when they're doing their job as landscape architects, what mattered was the size and the aesthetic value and the weed versus non-weed. In other words, the goal-oriented sorting mattered when they're doing their job as landscape architects. But they also knew that when they were looking after health or they were making inductions, that inductions were more likely to be driven by scientific category, not by uh, their own idiosyncratic goal-oriented uh, solution. So the taxonomists uh, were the most flexible group. By the way, highlighted that phrase in bold because that's a question on the exam. I ask which is the which group was the most flexible and why. Uh, so this is a great slide to study because it gives you the answer uh, to that question. Let's talk briefly about some examples of inflexibility. I wanna highlight these because I also ask a question about why does expertise sometimes lead you down the wrong path? So I'm not, I'm not gonna go into any of these studies in great detail. These are just quick examples. Inflexibility compared to novices, highly experienced tax practitioners, I talked about that early on, uh, were more likely to rely on previous knowledge than newly acquired knowledge about a similar case. So if experts are relying on what they already know, and if what you already know is somehow now obsolete, then you're not as good. You either need to get the new knowledge or uh, you rely on old knowledge, which means you're gonna make some mistakes. So you're less flexible. That's sort of a consequence of expertise is that you can find yourself in an expertise rut. You get really good at doing it a certain way. And if the way changes, uh, then you find yourself no longer an expert. This, of course, is why so many university uh, professors and instructors have gotten worried about things like artificial intelligence and generative language models, right? So if chat GPT can solve a problem better than the average uh, university professor can write the exam, <laughs> uh, as you know, chat GPT can pass the bar exam and it can get into med school. Uh, it does uh, high level performance on LSATs and MCAT tests. So it's really good at doing that kind of stuff. So a lot of university faculty and teachers aren't sure how to deal with it because it's not knowledge that we've been accustomed to having in terms of our how we design courses and how we design assessments. So in a sense, it's taken away our... <laughs> It's taken away an expertise advantage. So you, you have to get good at being able to figure out how to integrate uh, that technology uh, into classes. Um, there's also issues of expediency. 
Um, so a study by Lewandowski and Kirstner uh, looked at wildfires in Australia. So Steve Lewandowski, when he was uh, a faculty member uh, in Australia, was a year when there were a lot of wildfires, which increases every year because of climate change. Um, these wildfires can be really dangerous and they can move really fast. Experienced wildfire commanders relied almost solely on information about wind direction and ignored uh, the slope of the terrain. Uh, the reason is that they relied on the most quick, the quickest and most efficient predictor. Knowing that other things matter, when you need to be fast, uh, they determined that one of these is the faster predictor. Uh, so experts uh, tend to be uh, looking for expediency, but sometimes you're gonna make the mistake because the slope of the terrain also plays a role in how quickly and how, uh, how fast these different wildfires uh, spread. In this case, the expert commanders got really good at predicting uh, wildfires uh, just on speed alone, but that isn't always enough. Okay, some final thoughts and practical advice for your final exam and just in general. Um, so this summarizes, I think, the take-home messages of the entire course, not just to, of today's class. Brain and mind operate by matching patterns, similarity, and generalization. That should have been a message that came through in most of the classes we talked about, right? So we started with similarity because similarity underlies a lot of these things. It underlies even what we talked about today, recognizing the similarity between different kinds of surface and deep structures. Experts recognizing those deep feature similarities, novices paying attention uh, to uh, surface features. So that's what your brain and mind are doing all the time. They're trying to match patterns, make generalizations and predict the future. Um, we all make mistakes, even experts, as we saw at the very end, uh, do make errors. So all of us are making mistakes all the time, trying to learn from it. Um, all of these things like availability heuristic, the represent representativeness heuristic, false memories we talked about, confirmation bias, um, they, you know, they can trip us up a lot of times. But one of the things I want to make sure everybody uh, takes home is that they're a product, a byproduct of a well-functioning cognitive system. So your mind was designed to make these errors because we always have limited information and we're trying to make useful and adaptive predictions. Sometimes there are mistakes and we can create situations to isolate those mistakes like these errors here um, to show how the brain and mind work. But mostly, they're just, we're, we're using limited information. Our mind and brain have designed to use limited information quickly to make adaptive uh, predictions. Most of the time, those heuristics are right, but occasionally there are cognitive errors uh, and they're biases. But they're good biases for us most of the time. That's why we have them. You just need to be aware of them sometimes um, and consider practicing every so often a default interventionist approach to complex cognition. Uh, assume that system one is working to provide the fast, associative, and usually correct outcome. Uh, usually your instincts are right. Usually your instincts are correct, and usually your memory uh, based solutions are correct. Usually you find the right solution based on memory, right? That's how we ended up in a, that's how we all ended up here, right? We did things uh, academically uh, sufficiently well to get into university and to finish, uh, in some cases, your third or fourth year of university. So you get really good at doing those things, but every so often you do want to slow down to allow system two to work because sometimes you might be making the wrong uh, decision. So with that in mind, just thanks for being a good class and good luck on the final exam for this class, but good luck on all your finals uh, and have a great summer. It doesn't look like summer yet, but have a great summer when summer occurs. What happened? Oh. Oh.